Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know which what, what controls it. So I turn the, the lobby AC on, and then this way it's just the gas. So if you need to shut, we can shut it. But better. Alex, tu l'as Okay, who do we have here? MashaAllah. Alaikum salam for Allah, Sister Seema. Zakallah khair for joining. Um, okay, we will uh, start in just a few seconds. Inshallah, let me sort out just my papers here. Alaikum salam wa sister Layla. MashaAllah, good to see you guys. Well, yeah, better lighting, I think, is, is the right word. Ah, we have an unusual yeah. guest tonight. Look at that. So you made it, huh? Yeah. Well, yes, we will start. <clears throat> Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Um, Sir Jeffrey is here. Uh, Sister Navida, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, wa alaikum assalam, Sister Layla. And wa alaikum assalam, Omar. Even though I expected you to be here tonight, but hey, I'll let you off the hook this time. Uh, good to have you guys join us, mashallah. Ubaid, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Zakmul khair for joining us, you guys. Um, and Brother Ziyad, MashaAllah, Alaikum Assalam Rahmatullah. Good to have you guys. Uh, um, this is, inshallah, our first session, Surah Al Hijr. Surah Al Hijr is a shorter surah, so I'm not expecting us to take that many uh, Friday evenings to cover it. Uh, so, inshallah, maybe, I don't know, maybe three uh, tonight and two more nights. Inshallah, we'll see how it goes. Um, hopefully, not uh, more than that. But uh, incredible surah with uh, lots and lots of very profound. Uh, ideas, meanings, and connotations, a lot of philosophy in this surah, um, and uh, inshallah, as you will uh, um, investigate and explore with us, uh, lots and lots of very original, beautiful ideas that can inspire so much. So again, Jazakumullah Khairan for uh, joining us uh, for our tafsira program. Um, next week, inshallah ta'ala, next Friday, we are officially open uh, to the public. Uh, we are still limited in the number of people that we can accommodate. Uh, but uh, again, we are officially open, inshallah, uh, starting next Friday. Uh, so we are looking forward, even though we still have some people physically with us tonight, 
but we are looking forward inshallah to seeing you guys um with us uh, next week if you can join let me just maybe this is better get a little better lighting there <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I begin in the name of Allah I invoke his peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and I ask Allah to extend his blessings to the Prophet's family his companions um, and all the men and women that walk in the footsteps and I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to make us among them اللهم آمين uh, brothers and sisters جزاكم الله خيرا for tuning in uh, this is the Tafsira program uh, has been offered by the Tarbiya Institute almost every Friday night for the last five years. I'm very proud, alhamdulillah, of this program, very proud of those of you who have uh, been uh, instrumental in encouraging us to keep doing it every Friday night. Uh, I can't tell you the impact that this program had on me personally and my family, uh, let alone the community or even the, the, the serious students that are interested in this subject matter. Just every time I open the Qur'an and I engage the ayat and I recite them and I say to myself, SubhanAllah, it's either an ayah that I have already studied um, or an ayah uh, that I plan to study in the future. A surah that I have studied or a surah that I plan to study, inshallah. Uh, and so that has been an exciting, an absolutely exciting, uh, you know, breathtaking undertaking that I've, that I've embarked upon years ago with Allah's grace and with your help and support. So tonight, inshallah ta'ala, I'm very excited to uh, introduce to you or present to you uh, Surah Al-Hijr. And um, Surah Al-Hijr is a Meccan surah uh, that was basically revealed right around the time the boycott had just uh, concluded. So it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ over the upcoming months. And you have to understand that that is the time in which uh, the Messenger ﷺ lost his wife Khadija. It's the time in which he lost his uncle and greatest supporter, Abu Talib, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the economic boycott, most likely uh, uh, because of the adverse effects of the boycott on both of their health, uh, and they passed away. Uh, so we're talking about uh, the 10th year of the prophetic mission. Uh, this is 10 years after the Prophet wasallam encountered Jibreel wasallam for the first time. This is, uh, you know, a little less than three years before Hijrah. So we're getting closer and closer to covering the rest of the, the Meccan Qur'an before Hijrah is performed. And then, uh, you know, the Madani Qur'an uh, comes about. Let me start by saying this. And I know I already started, but, you know, I, I pose the question nonetheless. Uh, most of us would agree that Islam came to the world with a purpose, Right. And if someone said that Islam does not have a purpose, then either that person is not Muslim. Uh, you know, even people who are not Muslim, they would say that Islam was invented for a purpose, right? That uh, it was fabricated for a purpose. It was some personal agenda of Muhammad وسلم, or whatever, right? Um, so it, it, it really takes someone who's completely insane to say that Islam or religion in general uh, did not have a purpose. So there is a purpose, and the purpose... Uh, was designed, according to us Muslims, by the Creator Himself, uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, um, and 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 so you know, everything that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala created obviously has a purpose. So if if you know there is a purpose for the universe, even if we don't know the purpose, you know my kids ask me all the time, what is the purpose of frogs and, and flies, uh, and and most of the time I say I don't know. But I, I know that what I know for sure is that everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created has a place in the great cycle of life. And there is a wisdom. It is fulfilling a purpose. It's achieving a purpose, whether we know what that purpose is or not. Right. So what is the purpose of the creation of man, for example? You know, khalqul insan. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create man? You know, it's mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ so Allah told us, sometimes He tells us in the Qur'an what the purpose is of some of His creation, right? So He would say in the Qur'an, I have only created man and jinn in order to worship me. Okay, so that is easy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained it Himself. But what is the purpose of Islam, right? What is the purpose of Islam? Why did Islam come to the world? In fact, a much bigger and overarching question, what is the purpose of religion? What is the purpose of organized religion? 
What is the purpose of sending prophets and messengers to this earth? I covered that topic. If you guys remember, those of you who were tuned in a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Friday spiritual talk, when I cited the ayah uh, from Surah Al-Hadid, ayah number 25, I said, uh, I, I forgot. Do you remember the لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا وَأَنْزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ See, I'm, 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 I'm all troubled right now. So I have to um, cite this ayah properly for you guys uh, because it has a very important word that I want you to uh, memorize. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ I apologize. لقد أرسلنا رسولنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقصة. الله سبحانه وتعالى says I have sent my prophets and messengers with clear signs, right? Signs uh, that testify to the existence of the divine. لقد أرسلنا رسولنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان. And we have sent with them the books, the scriptures, and الميزان. The scale by which they are able to measure what is right and what is wrong. What is Al Mizan here, by the way? I didn't talk about it in the spiritual talk because there was no time. But Al Mizan in this particular ayah is your fitra. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I sent prophets and messengers, and I sent with them uh, very clear signs, and I sent uh, with the scriptures and the innate compass in, in each and every one of us so that we are able to decide what is right and what is wrong on our own in order to achieve one sole purpose and one purpose only and that is nasu bil qist, so that people may establish qist and a lot of people uh, translate the word qist as uh, justice but what's the word for justice in Arabic that is often used? Adl because Allah's name, Al-Adl, the most just, right? So the, if, if we're talking about justice, the word for justice is Adl. So Qist is something else. Qist, it's not very far off from, from, from justice, but I think it's more comprehensive than justice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, mentioned the word Qist in the Quran repeatedly. What is Qist? Qist is a, a justly balanced equity in, in the universe, right? Qist is when everything works with everything else, harmoniously. Justice is, is, is a very interactive process that involves agents, that involves, uh, 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 you know, sort of like um, uh, animate agents that work with each other. And so your relationship with the judge is, is a matter of, of adil. Your relationship with the, ju with the judge is a matter of uh, uh, justice. Your relationship with your spouse is the matter of justice or adil. Your relationship uh, with with uh, other people in society, but we don't think that um, the harmony between myself and gravity is a matter of justice, right? But if I think of relationships in the universe as a consideration of harmony, that as much as and and so I say that adil, the word for justice in Arabic, is actually uh, of of a smaller scope than the word qist. The word qist is much bigger than the word adl. The word adl involves, you know, agency between two intellectual beings, either each other or us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That involves adl or the form, the lesser form of justice. But when justice becomes the inherent consideration in every relationship in the universe, then it becomes a matter of qist, right? So, um, myself being in harmony with gravity is a matter of qist. You know, I respect the boundaries of gravity and gravity respects my boundaries. When I go crazy and I jump from the third floor, then I am violating the boundaries of gravity. What usually happens to me, I'm going to fall and, and, and break my neck, all right? The, the harmony between uh, 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 us as he, the human community and the environment, for example, when we try to utilize or take advantage of the environment to the extent that we are not destroying that environment, then it becomes a matter of qist. Once we have crossed and violated that boundary, what usually happens? Sheer destruction, right? 
And so this is how I want you to understand the meaning of the word qist. So لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بالقسط, So that people may establish an equitous, harmonious relationship between each other, between them and God, and between them and every other component of the universe. Right? Really, really important to understand that. Now, if that is the purpose of religion, is to establish justice in its wider or, or more grander form, uh, when, when we are able to respect the boundaries, and once we've respected the boundaries, right, you know, harmony will, will uh, sort of like prevail. In other words, once I have known that that is the objective of, of the deen, then I need to find out more. How do we achieve Al-Qist. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the purpose is so that people may establish a grander form of justice, then the, the next question has to become, how do I achieve that? Right? And in order to answer that question, what do we need to do? We need to delve into Islamic law in order to understand how is it that Islamic law taught us about the establishment of Qist in the universe. Let me recap what I just said so far, all right? I'm not talking about justice here in the sense of just relationships or, uh, you know, being fair. I am talking about justice as in a, a, a balance of the universe in which there are certain boundaries in, in all types of relationships and those boundaries should not be crossed and should not be violated, right? There's a preservation of those boundaries. That is the meaning of qist here, right? And I said that the very purpose of Islam and religion in general is for human beings to be able to understand what those boundaries are and not cross them. This is how we establish qist, right? Uh, be, and, and, and it is only through that process of preserving the boundaries that we maintain harmony in, in all of our relationships between us and each other, us and Allah, and us and the universe, okay? Now, Islamic law details for us what it means to observe the boundaries what it means to preserve the boundaries, okay? And the word that is often used in Islamic law is maqasid al-sharia. What is maqasid al-sharia? The purposes of Islamic law, you know, iran, surprising, oh, well, not surprisingly, because we're talking about the purpose of Islam, now we talk about the purpose of Islamic law. And if the purpose of Islam is to establish qist, then the purpose of Islamic law has to do with detailing how that observation of qist is actually carried out, right? Maqasid al-Sharia is a very, very interesting branch of Islamic knowledge. And see, see the word that I used? I didn't say that it's a branch of Islamic law, or it's a branch of Islamic sciences. It's, it's a branch of Islamic epistemology, because as, as a branch of knowledge, it actually evolved over time. So it's Maqasid al-Sharia, or the purposes of Islamic law, started off as... A, 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 a fiqhi discussion between the scholars, okay? And then that fiqhi conversation became a theological conversation. And most theological conversations, if taken through to the very end, they ultimately and inevitably have to become what? They have to become philosophical conversations, no matter what. You keep pushing the boundaries of theology, you have to step into the realm of philosophy no matter what. So you have a fiqhi discussion that evolved into a theological discussion that became a philosophical discourse and every philosophical discourse when settled becomes what in the end? No. Think for example of the philosophical discourse that America underwent about abortion in the 1950s and the 1960s. When that conversation was settled, what happened? to the conversation about abortion, it became what? It became law, right? The end product of a philosophical discourse is, is the creation of laws. Because now we've been struggling with a conceptual matter for so long in order to try to decide which direction to take, right? And once that has been resolved, it becomes a matter of law, right? And so you investigate the history of, of maqasid al-sharia, you know, all the way from the time of Imam al-Juwayni. And Imam al-Juwayni in his great book, Al-Burhan, Fi Usul al-Fiqh, was perhaps one of the very first scholars to talk about Maqasid al-Sharia, about the purposes of Islamic law. 
Imam al-Ghazali is probably one of the more known ones. He, in Al-Mustasfa, his great book, he writes about it. Al-Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, in his book Al-Mahsul, he writes about it. Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam, the great Shafi'i scholar of Egypt. In Qawa'id al-Ahkam, he writes about it. Imam al-Qarafi, in his book Al-Furuq, he writes about it. Al-Shatubi, in his you know, widely popular Al-Muwafaqat, also writes about it. But what really popularized Maqasid al-Sharia in Muslim intellectual sphere uh, in, in the Muslim world was the great scholar of Tunis, who was actually uh, the judge of Tunis, uh, one of the top judges in the 1940s and in the 1950s, right? Al-Imam Al-Tahir ibn Ashur, alayhi uh, rahmatullah, who was you know, a great scholar who stood up against um, the tyrant of Tunis at the time, Al-Habib Burghiba, um, and really kept him in check. Uh, Al-Tahir ibn Ashur formulated Qasid al-Sharia. He took everything that the scholars have written about over the centuries and put it together in his great seminal work, Maqasid al-Sharia al-Islami, right? And, 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 you know, these books are available in Arabic, by the way, for those who are interested in the academic conversation on Maqasid, okay? Today, you have scholars like, you know, uh, uh, Wahb al-Zuhayli, uh, Dr. Yusuf al-Qardawi, uh, Muhammad Salim al-Awwa, Faisal Mawlawi, Isam Bashir, and others who, are, who continue to write about Maqasid al-Sharia, because Maqasid al-Sharia, or the purposes of Islamic law, continues to be an extremely relevant discussion today. Why is it that uh, 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 marriage is done this way? Why is it that women are supposed to dress more modestly than men, in, generally speaking? Why is it that the laws of inheritance are like this? Why is it that uh, you know the, the penal code is like that? Right. So Maqasid al-Sharia answers the questions of why in Islamic law. Right. Now let me ask you a question. All this introduction about Maqasid al-Sharia or the purposes of Islamic law, what are the purposes of Islamic law then? If the scholars have you know, beaten it to death over the centuries, thousands and thousands of times, shouldn't we know what the purposes of Islamic law are? What are the purposes of Islamic law? Remember, the purpose of, of religion in general is what? Exactly. The purpose of religion in general is for people to establish the, a grander form of justice that is called qist in the Quran. Okay? And I said that uh, maqasid al-sharia details for us how that process is actually carried out. So what are maqasid al-sharia? Maqasid al-sharia are basically the preservation of how many things? The preservation of five things. I, I'm going to reduce to you one of the most complex conversations in Islamic history, but I will reduce it literally into you know layman's terms that the Islamic Sharia, you know, the scary Sharia law, right, has five purposes, has five purposes, and those five purposes revolve around the preservation, okay? Hifz and nafs, the preservation of? The preservation of life, right? Protection of life. Hifz Al-Aql, the preservation of mind or intellect. Hifdhu al-Deen, the preservation of religion or faith. That, that people are not completely pushed to the limits of disenchantment. That people are continue to be connected with the divine. That religion continues to play a big role in people's lives, right? Um, and then Hifdhu al-Mal, the preservation of wealth. And the last one is Hifdhu al ird What is Hifdhu al ird The preservation of honor. What does that mean? That you, you have to be uh, preserved and protected from people attacking your, your honor, your dignity, libel, people backbiting you, uh, you know, people taking away your freedom, right? All of that is included under Hifdhu al ird Let me recap, all right? This is really important, and this will stay with us for at least three weeks. Islam, like everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, and I say created, by the way, with a grain of salt. A lot of people, they hear the word created, they freak out because of ancient conversations that happened between the Muslims about other things that Allah created, and they fought each other for it, like the Quran, for example. 
so I, 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 I use the word created with a grain of salt, you know, in the deen and Allah Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Islam as his, as his, as his deen before he chose us for humanity, right? Um, and so Islam, I don't want to delve into the conversation, is Islam something that Allah created at some point? Or Islam has always been with him because it, it was a reflection of his own ideas and ideals, okay? That will take us another thousand years to answer. So I'm not going to get into that. So when I say uh, Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Islam to this world for a purpose. And that pur purpose is uh, to help us establish the boundaries of equitous behavior, the boundaries of, of harmony, to make sure that we respect relationships in this universe, uh, to make sure that we act in a justly balanced uh, fashion. And, and the word that covers all of this is the word qist. The word qist is fascinating, by the way, because, you know, qist uh, 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 means measurement of something. Uh, the word for installment in Arabic, like if you buy something from Best Buy with installment, the monthly installment is called what? It was called qist, right? There is a calculation about it. There's a measurement about it. There's an ease about it. There's a respect of a contractual agreement that is involved with it, right? I can talk about the word qist a lot, but I don't want to do that. You know, I, I think it's, it suffices to what I've, what I've already covered, right? So the purpose of Islam is to establish this qist in the world, right? The purposes of Islamic law details for us how this process actually happens. And I said earlier that this is about creating harmony through the respecting of boundaries, through the preservation of boundaries. And so if I understand that life Life is a boundary, and I should not cross that boundary. You know, then that then I'm 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 able to achieve the purpose of Islam or religion itself when I preserve life. Okay, when I know that other people's property is not fair game, public or private, then I am also preserving or or uh, preserving plus or establishing plus. Uh, you know, th through the preservation of wealth, uh, when I give people the freedom of religion. When I respect the human mind and the human intellect, right? Uh, 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 and I, actually, let me let me give you a few examples for each one. You look at the laws in, in in Islam against murder, the laws against suicide, the laws against uh, uh, abortion, right? All of these laws are designed in order to achieve which type of preservation? Hevlu nafs, the preservation of life, right? Uh, you look at uh, you know laws against theft. Laws against bribery, laws against extortion, you know, all of that, these laws are designed to protect what? To protect mal or to protect wealth, right? Uh, you have, uh, you know, there is no compulsion in religion. You know, this is a law that would, would be intended to preserve what? To preserve, to at least to preserve religion, you know. Uh, well, you know, actually it could be, it could be included under the, uh, under the last one as well. Uh, laws against, uh, you know, drugs and uh, intoxication and, uh, uh, you know, all these kinds of things are designed to uh, protect what? See? So if you look at the injunctions of Islamic law, you will realize that all of them at one point or the other are in place in order to preserve one of those five components of our existence. Okay? Uh, the preservation of life, the preservation of the... Uh, of the intellect, the preservation of religion, the preservation of wealth, and the preservation of honor, dignity, and freedom. Okay? Now, let me take you on a flashback to what was happening at the Prophet's time when Surah Al-Hajr was revealed. The economic boycott is over. The Muslims are now back to their homes. Uh, the 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 treaty that put the boycott together was completely dismantled i said it was a it was this activist these activists from mecca that were not muslims that started the process okay and so yes muslims are home now and you know they're not uh, in this big open jail anymore but the three years of 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 a, of a boycott came at a tremendous tremendous toll okay number one Many Muslims had already lost their lives. They died, including uh, Khadija and Abu Talib. They already died as a result of this uh, boycott. Um, the boycott, uh, uh, in addition to not marrying from the Muslims or allowing the Muslims to marry from Quraysh, what was the second most important article of the boycott? 
I mean, they call it the economic boycott. So what are they boycotting? Business transactions. So you cannot buy from the Muslims or sell to them or other or, or vice versa. So uh, not only that it came with a toll on uh, on life, it also came with a toll on on wealth. It, an absolute utter economic devastation for the Muslim community and for Banu Hashim um, as well. Uh, people who thought for a second about converting to Islam, what happened to them? They were absolutely frightened to even think about the idea. Did some Muslims actually leave Islam as a result of what happened? Absolutely. And we talked about that before, right? The very continuity of Islam itself was in question. The Muslim community's reputation is being devastated and attacked and their freedom, their freedom is in complete limbo. Would you or would you not agree with me that the economic boycott was a clear violation of every single boundary that human beings have the right to take for granted? Was it or was it not? And so, nafs was violated, right? A lot of people were killed, uh, they died. Uh, 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 aql was, was, was violated. Uh, a lot of people are now having aqida issues and they're having doubts in their minds. Is God really on my side? Am I doing the right thing? What's going on? Right? Uh, uh, Deen was was devastated. Uh, a lot of people are leaving Islam and a lot of people that would have, would have converted, they refused to convert. The very continued continuity of Islam, you know, is, is in jeopardy. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, wealth has been completely devastated and ird the honor of the Muslims and their freedom, you know, have been completely devastated as well. And so, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to send a surah at that particular juncture, what does, it's, it's a very interesting juncture. They're already out of the calamity of the boycott, but they are not out of the water yet. They're kind of like in that situation, just recovering from it. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to send a surah around that time, what is it that that surah needs to cover? Think about it. You're a Muslim, you're coming out of boycott, and you are bleeding as a result of the, those five violations happen to you. What is it that you expect in that surah? What type of guidance needs to come to you in that surah? The surah has to show me that the preservation of those five things is not necessarily and always going to be my job. That sometimes I need to rely on the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those five things to be preserved. So that I, I am not always worried. Islam will be devastated. My family will be killed. My money will be lost. I need to realize that there are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects so that I'm able to do my job. So that I'm able to focus on myself, my family, my activism, my da'wah, bringing people to Islam, so that I can pick myself up and keep going, so that I can stand on uh, solid uh, on solid ground. So I need a surah that talks about hifz, that talks about protection and preservation. And Surah Al-Hijr was revealed around that time in order to offer this sorely needed assurance to the believers. It's a surah that extensively talks about the preservation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The preservation of life, the preservation of the mind, the preservation of uh, the intellect, the mind and the intellect, the preservation of religion and faith, the preservation of wealth, and the preservation of freedom. And once I realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an active agent in that preservation process, I will say to myself, you know what, all I need to do is just do my part, and the rest is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the assurance that I need at this point. Now here's the thing. If I know that qist means there are boundaries that must not be violated. And I need to understand 
what the nature of those boundaries are, and I need to understand how the, the rights are preserved and protected. It is just as important to understand the elements of nature that cause devastation to those rights. Think of it as, uh, you know, I don't know, being the, the, the legal system. The legal system needs to pay attention to both components across the, the line of divide. Okay, uh, you know, for example, I need to pay attention to how I protect my house, how I conduct my business, how I protect myself from identity theft. You know, my behavior online and all of these things. Okay, but in the event that somebody stole your credit card and used it, the, the justice system also needs to pay attention to what. Pay attention to uh, the breach that happened, you know, in, in your firewall. Pay attention to the, 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 the people that have committed the crime and why they should be punished and why they got to you at this point and, you know, where, you know, things went haywire, okay? So the, the, the surah itself cannot just focus on the things that need to be preserved. It also needs to focus on what? How they're violated. And what violates them? Okay. Now there is one word, you know, like I said, the word that, that is really important in Surah Al-Hijr is the word hifz, not hifz as in hifz al-Quran, which is another interesting word. The mem it's not the memorization of the Quran. Hifz al-Quran is what? Is the preservation of Quran. Okay. So when, when someone is a hafiz, we think that, that that person memorizes the Quran, whereas linguistically and Islamically, the word hafiz means someone that preserves. Some of the, and this will actually say to my kids when they memorize the Quran, I tell them, you become a vehicle by which the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being protected in this world. Like, what an honor. Very, very different than thinking, thinking of it as, as memorizing the Quran, right? And so um, as, as I think of, of the preservation of rights, I also need to think of the violators of rights. As I think of hifz, I need to think of the catastrophic events of life that cross the boundaries, that uh, disrupt the harmony, that make qist very, very difficult to achieve. There is one word, one word that is very, very commonly used to describe those events of life. That, that you know, pushes to the edge, that put through the test all of those five things that we hold so dear. What is that word? It's the word fitna. As I want to learn how to protect, I need to know what the enemy is. And I need to know where the trial is coming from. Okay. So as we learn about Hifz in Surah Al-Hijr, we will also learn about Fitan, the trials and tribulations. And the scholars divide the types of Fitna, you know, just like I shared with you, um, the purposes of Islamic law, the five purposes. Uh, I also want to share with you what the scholars said about the types of trials. All right, so they talk about fitna to shahawat. Shahawat is plural uh, for shahwa. What is shahwa? Shahwa is a lustful desire. You think of you know great men that were brought to their knees and their their future was destroyed, you know, because of an affair. Politicians and pastors and very you know famous people that were completely destroyed. Their future was devastated because of a moment of weakness, right? Um, you think of, of someone that raped someone in, in the spur of the moment. Uh, you think of people who do drugs and people who drink alcohol. Uh, you think of people who travel to other countries in order to engage in absolutely disgusting behavior because there are things that are not legal here that would be legal in other countries, right? Just think of the toll that lust has had on man throughout history. And you will be able to understand a magnitude of lust or lustful desires as a trial. Are there halal lusts? Yes, when you lust for your spouse, for example. When you lust, uh, you know, to get your paycheck. All right? You're not trying to, to steal anyone's money. You know, I need the money because I want to buy food and stuff, right? So sometimes, sometimes there are certain types of lust that I use lust, you know, with liberty here. It's, it's probably a very dramatic word, 
but what, what I'm saying is that there are not all desires are bad. Ambition. You know, ambition is also a form of lust. But if you kill someone in, in, in order to leave their place, then that's when the, the boundaries of equity have been violated. See? Right? Because so when we think of a fitna, we're not trying to eliminate all the tendencies, we're just saying that there are boundaries. And as long as you stay within the boundaries, then harmony, the harmony of qist is being preserved. And that's what really what really matters. So fitna to shahawat, the, the, the trial of lustful desires. Okay. Number two, fitna to shubuhat and shubuha and shahwa are two words that are actually like they sound similar, but they're two very different words. So uh, shahwa is singular, shahawat is plural. Uh, with the same token, shubuha is, is singular and shubuhat is plural. Fitna to shubuhat, the trial of doubts. Doubts. Shubuha is that. So may, uh, I, I talked to you guys uh, a few weeks ago about this Muslim girl that used to be, subhanAllah, back in the day, used to be in, in, in involved in the youth, in, with the youth and in the community. And, and she ended up, she met this guy who turns out to be a youth pastor as a ch at, at, at a church. She converts to Christianity because she wants to be with him. Okay? What kind of lust is that? What type of fitna is this? This is shahwa. She was driven by, by shahwa. She was driven by passion, by whim. She was driven by spur of the moment type of desire, right? Hawa. But if someone lo loses their faith because they struggle with atheism, then what type of, of fitna is this? This is shubuhat. This is the fitna of doubts. So doubts, uh, concerns about faith, intellectual restlessness, uh, all the stuff that erodes your aqidah from within. So shahwa is usually coming from, from the outside. And shubuha is usually coming from it comes from within. From within, it, it it it's triggered by outside factors, but it usually it has to be you that will internalize it and allow it to mess you up. Okay. Third, fitnat as zaman. What does that mean? Is what is zaman? Yeah, zaman is the, just the passage of time. Yeah, like akhir zaman, the end of time. All right. So fitnat as zaman is what? It's the passage of time. What does the passage of time do to us? Maybe it's not the, the lust that will destroy you. Maybe it's not the doubt that will destroy you. But how can time destroy you? Passage of time will yield boredom, callousness, ingratitude. You know, routine becomes a part of your life. You take things for granted. Uh, you lose your enthusiasm and you just become a machine. You lose your grip over time, right? You cannot hold your grip like this for long. Eventually your grip will loosen and, and you might let go of your faith over time. Fourth is fitna to zalimi. And what is that? A trial of? A trial of oppression, a trial of tyrants. Right, so think of you know false imprisonment, uh, uh, you know torture, exile, corruption, all the kinds of things that you know people may suffer from in, in hope in other countries, and hopefully not not in America yet. You know, it seems like we're headed in that direction. Um, but those are the four types of fitness. So we also expect that um, uh, Surah Al-Hijr, as it explains to us. The, 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 the five types of preservation that Surah Al-Hijr will probably also explain to us the four types of trials. Okay, So when we study Surah Al-Hijr, we will study it with that in mind or with that spirit um, in mind. So this is the Surah that was sent to the Muslims in the aftermath of the economic boycott, helping them restore some self-confidence, helping, helping them restore some type of, of insight and perspective to realize, okay, you know, what happened, happened. It's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now. I need to, you know, stay the course. I need to pick myself up. I need to continue. I need to keep moving forward, right? I'm not going to let this devastate me. And it opens your eyes to what needs to be protected and to the threat that needs to be fended off. Does that make sense? All right. At the very, very core of Surah Al-Hijr is... 
Ayah number 9 Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra Wa inna lahu lahafidhun That is fascinating A surah that is about preservation Has one of the most popular ayat in the Quran It is us who have revealed the Quran And it is, and it is us that will preserve it Because there's a lot of these Muslim vanguard type who think that their job in, in, in the world is to protect Islam from corruption and to protect the Quran from corruption. You know, I, I cannot get that scene out of my head. I swear to God, it still troubles me to this day. So we were at the cemetery seven or eight years ago, okay? And uh, a dear brother, if you guys remember him, his name was Amin Best. Do you remember this brother? He was, uh, he was the African-American African -American brother, he was had a the, PhD. He was the uh, principal of Renato. At some point he was, you're right, you're absolutely right. He was a really, was a really delightful brother. And, you know, I met him at, uh, at a fundraiser at Salam so many years ago, I think 2007 or something like that. And, and he made a, a significant pledge that evening. SubhanAllah, he developed cancer and he passed away. And so it was his, it was his janazah, and I was there attending his janazah, right? And the, the janazah, you know, not surprisingly, which is very, very unfortunate to say, was mostly attended by, by brothers and sisters from the black community. Uh, which, again, that's that's another subject I don't want to get into because I, we're not going to finish today if I got into that, right? So that was that was atrocious in and of itself. I was very one of few non-black people that were there. Um, and so I'm there, you know, and a couple of uh, uh, imams from the, from the African-American community were there, and they were conducting the, the service, and everything was done properly to the letter. Right, and I was very grateful for how they conducted it. And then, you know, one of the imams started saying La ilaha illallah, and other people started saying La ilaha illallah as well. Is there anything wrong with saying La ilaha illallah? It's just crazy. There's nothing wrong with saying La ilaha illallah, right? So this other imam, without mentioning any names, who who adheres to a completely different, very rigid school of thought, shows up out of nowhere. Apparently, he was there attending uh, maybe another funeral. He made it a point to go up to this gathering and to yell at the two imams and say, you know, this is bid'ah, what you're doing is bid'ah, this is inappropriate, you can't do that, you need to stop. So the imams, I appreciate your, your advice, thank you. And, and he kept insisting to the extent that one of the imams, one of the black imams, yelled at him and said, this is my community. And you have no place here. And you have no respect for these people that are grieving. You can... Reserve your preaching to some other time. Why are you doing it right here? So he, he, the imam walked away. And he was really, really upset. And as he was walking away, um, I heard him say this, at least I've done my part. At least I've done my part. In his heart, he pro probably thinks that he did the right thing. Because he's scared. If I don't go and protect Islam from bid'ah, that Islam will be messed up. Whereas the ayah says what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm the one that sent, and he doesn't even say the Quran, he says, nazzalna All forms of reminders that are divinely initiated. Okay? Quran, and Quran is probably at the very core of all of that, but I would add to this all other types of human knowledge that is derived from the Quran. All other types of inspiration that are derived from the, that is derived from the Quran, and and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Islam is has this sort of like self-corrective mechanisms that the Ummah, the Prophet in the Hadith, you know, ala dalala. The Ummah will never build consensus around mischief and falsehood. We always come back to orthodoxy. We always come back to the core. We always come back to what is right. I mean, look at uh, at the English language. Look at Shakespearean English. When did Shakespeare live? 1600s. It's not like a thousand years ago, right? Compare Shakespearean English with, with uh, present-day English. I mean, if Shakespeare heard my daughter talk, he won't understand a single word. Right? She, she studies Macbeth, right, and Julius Caesar, and A Midsummer Night's Dream or whatever, and she's trying to, like, you know, struggle through... Shakespearean English in order to understand what he's saying. But I don't that Shakespeare, you know, would understand what these guys are saying. I mean, I have a hard time myself understanding what they're saying sometimes. Uh, uh, now, go back a couple hundred years earlier before Shakespeare. What did Europe speak? 
I mean, it's not the, it's not Shakespearean English, right? It was some other mutilation of, of Latin. And Latin evolved from Greek and so forth, okay? Over the last 2,000 years, languages all over the world have evolved so much. Except, except Arabic. What do we owe this for? What do we owe this to? To the Quran. To this day, poets use Quranic references. Uh, TV anchors use Quranic references. Uh, journalists use Quranic references. You go to Morocco, they'll speak their own local dialect. You go to Egypt, they have their local dialect. You go to Qatar, they have their own local dialect. But if you hear their TV anchors, you know, uh, on the news, on the six o'clock news, they'll all be speaking what? They'll all be speaking Fusha, the Quranic Arabic, right? It's the only experience in the world. I mean, not even the Bible, not even Hebrew. Even Hebrew today is built on what? Is built on a series of, of uh, inverse translations. You know, you know that, right? The 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 Old Testament was basically translated back from Western European languages into, uh, uh, you know, into into Latin and from Latin to Greek and from from Greek to to Hebrew. And then when they found the the red the the Dead Sea Scrolls, they compared what they came up with because the, the Torah had disappeared from the world. They compared what they came up with with the scrolls, but the funny thing is that the scrolls, that's a draft. It's not even the full Torah. It was a draft of the scribes. So there's a lot of conflicting stuff in the scrolls. But, but they looked at their inverse translation versus what they considered to be an approximation of the original document. And he was like, oh, okay, I mean, it's not that far off, right? It's not, it's not like, you know, we're talking about two different gods here. But... Compare that to how harmonious the process of preserving the Quran was. Okay, very, very different process, completely different process. So we should never worry about who's protecting Islam because it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is protecting Islam. Maybe the entire American Muslim community will vanish and disappear, and there will be no no Muslims in America. But will Islam change or be altered? That that, that is that is different because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that took that task upon himself. Last thing I wanted to say tonight is the title of the surah itself. This is Surah Al-Hijr. Okay? Does it have other names? Oh, wait a second. Can a Quranic surah have more than one name? Oh my God. Astaghfirullah. Do I have a problem with my aqidah? Any vanguard wants to correct me? What are some of the other names of Surah Al-Fatiha? Names that the Prophet ﷺ used. Umm Al-Kitab, the mother of the book. Umm Al-Quran, right? Surah Al-Hamd. These are actual, actual names that are given in the deen to this surah. Uh, surah Al-Tawbah. The other name of Surah Al-Tawbah is Surah Bara'a. Actually, my shaykh used to say that. Uh, recite Bara'a. He would, he would go like this, right? What's the other name for Surat Maryam? Kaf Haya Ain Sat. What's the other name of Surat Al Naml, the ants? Some of the Sahaba used to call it Surat Sulaiman because of the extended story of Sulaiman in there. Surat Ghafir has another name, Surat Al Mu'min. Al Rahman is Arus Al Quran, the bride of the Quran. What is the other name of Surat Al Hijr? Take a guess. Surah Al-Hif. Of course, some of you are like, why didn't you just say that from the very beginning? Well, it wouldn't be fun if I did. <laughs> Surah Al-Hif. So I hope now you understand why it's called that. Subhanallah. But what is the meaning of Hijr, really? We know Hif. Hif is preservation, protection. But what is the meaning of Hijr? What is the meaning of Hijr? What does it sound like? No, no, this is ha, not ha. Hijra is with a ha. This one is a ha, ha, hijr. It sounds like hajr, right? Stone, rock, it, particularly from the mountains, okay? So this, the surah talks about ashabul hijr, the people of the hijr. Who are those people? 
They're the people of Thamud. Who is the prophet that was sent to Thamud? Salih alayhi salam, right? So these people used to carve their homes in, in the mountains. H have you ever been to Jordan's Petra? You guys you know what I'm talking about, the city in, in Jordan, where all the temples and all this stuff is, is carved in the mountains? It was almost identical to Petra. In fact, many historians say that the, the people of Thamud and the people that occupied Petra were, were somehow related to each other. Okay. Now, Thamud were the predecessors of another people that were destroyed in the, you know, in, in the, the Quran told us about. Ad. Ad and their prophet Hud. And they used to live, uh, you know, close to the Persian Gulf. They were destroyed by a hurricane. So they're, the survivors and their predecessors, they decided to do what? To go as far inland as possible, go up, up north into the mountains and to build their homes by carving them out in the rocks of the mountains so that they are the absolute most stable, so that they provide what for themselves and their families? Hevd. They wanted to bring Hevd to themselves. But the, the only difference is that this is Hivd that is disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the title of the surah is, is not without irony. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a surah is really interesting. You know, a surah, surah to Hivd, preservation, he uses Hijr, which, which sounds like Hajar, right? Like rocks, right? As the title of that surah, in reference to a people who used to carve. And it's interesting because the people of Thamud are mentioned in the Quran so many times. This is the only time in the Quran they're called Ashab al Hajr. Why? Because there's there's a moral that is being taught here. You know, you can run, but you can't hide. You can give yourself the illusion of protection, but protection only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are on his side. Remember in Ramadan, I talked about. The only way to protect yourself from the firing of the archer is to stand next to the archer, right? And so they think that they can be in the battlefield, downrange, and still be protected from the arrows of the archer, which is impossible, okay? So hajar implies stability, strength, protection, preservation, right? Now... Um, when they say in the Arab world, you know, take the baby and put the baby on your lap, what's the word that they use? Hijr. Lap in Arabic is hijr. Put the baby in, you know, they say in Arabic. This is a word that is used today. Why do we use the word hijr to describe the lap? Because it is in the lap that the child is protected and preserved and nurtured and loved. See? Absolutely fascinating. Okay? Here's another meaning to the word hijr. Um, when there is a, a, an infectious disease and they quarantine people in, a, in one branch of the hospital, like if you go to... Um, there are countries now where, like in Egypt, for example, if you travel, they'll put you in a 14-day quarantine in a hotel. I don't know why they wouldn't just do the test in order to know whether you're, you're positive or not. They have to, you know, torment you for 14 days. Uh, you know what that's called? It's called the hajr. al hajr al-sahi, they call it, which is the, the Arabic word for quarantine. Because it is in quarantine that who's preserved? Others are preserved from any possible infection that you may bring. Okay. Last but not least, when in in the Middle East, and again, this is this is you know modern day stuff. In the Middle East, when um, when someone grows old and that person, you know, is is on the verge of insanity or someone who has uh, a dementia or uh, Alzheimer's or something, and that person becomes incapable of making financial decisions or, or being responsible for themselves. So somebody else from their family needs to assume legal guardianship. Okay. You know what that process is called in Egypt? It's called Al-Hajr. They say, يَحْجُرْ عَلَيْهِ 
to declare someone unfit to be their own guardian. So somebody else has to be their guardian, their protector, the one that preserves them. I'm, I'm telling you, the miracle of the Quran, you know, continues to be alive. You know, it's very alphabet. It's very words are used presently. You know, there is no Quranic word that is archaic. As opposed to the Arabic language itself, by the way, there's a lot of archaic Arabic languages. Like if you, if you read, uh, you know, Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma, you know, his poetry from the days of Jahiliyyah, half of his poetry I don't understand. Really complex words or words I've never seen before. But not the Quran. Not the Quran. Every single word in the Quran continues to be alive and, is, and has its own usage to this day. And that actually preserves the... Uh, the Arabic language itself. And so what is happening here with all of these different meanings and applications and perceptions of the word hijr, that is inshallah we're going to find out together in the next two weeks. But I just wanted you to be prepared for a wondrous journey, a journey into you know, mind, into philosophy, into the cosmos, a journey into the universe, into the world, into the boundaries of, of human ingenuity, in the boundaries of human intellect, into the, the lines between good and evil. Right, and what it all means uh, uh, to us today. I will end here, inshallah, jazakumullah khairan uh, for listening so attentively. I'll take a couple of questions and we will have to let you guys go at 8 45, inshallah, so that you can pray uh, Maghrib because we are not permitted yet to pray Maghrib here per our safety regulations. So let me take some questions, inshallah, if you guys have any. And I'm sorry, Omar, I, 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 I give you a hard time on, uh, on YouTube. <laughs> so it's recorded for eternity now that I picked on you. And you were, poor guy, he was on his way. He was actually on his way. I think he made a mistake of commenting. I was like, yeah, he's just sitting at home watching through his 55-inch smart TV, having a good time on the, on the sofa. <laughs> was, was being played on, on my way. Oh, like I didn't have to do that. Imam, may I ask a question? Please. First of all, thank you. It's been too long. I know, man. Uh, I know. It's very good. Inshallah, next week, many more. I mean, inshallah. I mean, uh, Imam, you know, uh, the thing that you were reminding me of when we talked about the five reasons for religion, religion and you listed them out, uh, it was reminding me of one of the quotes of Karl Marx that people use. And they say that religion is the opium of the masses. And they just use that one phrase, and it's, I think, misinterpreted to say that, you know, it's used to control people. That's what religion is meant to do. But if you look at that full quote of Karl Marx, he says something along the lines of religion is the sigh of the oppressed. It is the soul of a soulless world. It is a heart of the heartless conditions. It is the opium of the masses. And what he was trying to say there was that religion... He probably didn't meant it in the same negative light that most of us think. Right, right. Mm -hmm. When you just take out one sentence and take it out of the full, uh, full quote. Uh, but so what he, he's trying to say there, and I think that's what, he, what he's meaning, is that so often religion has been a source of peace for people going through all, and seeing all types it's like of water things. on fire. Right, mm -hmm. right, both personal as well as external, that we witness. Uh, and, and when that is not there, people resort to all sorts of other ways to find that peace. And people say, when you think about the opioid epidemic that people are going through right now, mm -hmm. to numb the pain that they otherwise cannot make any sense of. That's the real opium of the masses, huh? Uh, that is the real opium of the masses, right? When you lose the uh, uh, real opium, then you resort to artificial mm -hmm. opium, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is then, you know, I feel that people uh, in this day and age have resorted, for whatever the reasons might be, to other sources of finding that peace or to be meeting that honor and dignity, one of the five reasons for religion they're finding other means of doing it and how do we combat or not combat but say uh offer our proposal 
uh, in saying that you know what we are offering, religious people, I guess in general, are offering, is more of a comfort than uh, for meeting those five conditions than what other people might be resorting to. I mean, that's <clears throat> that's a great question. I don't know if I have a compre comprehensive answer to this. Um, see, the 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 evolution of religious thought, and therefore the application of religious thought in human life and the utility of religion in general is a matter that is incumbent upon the movements of history. It has little to do with religion itself and a lot to do with where a religious community stands vis-a-vis -vis the evolution of history. Our period right now is, 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 a, is a, a time period in which religion is being attacked, in which religion is cornered, in which religious ideas are, are being, you know, devastated. Uh, and people who are religious are, are ve very, very busy with conversations that are not really helping them or helping others at all. It, it actually reminds me, if you, I don't know how familiar you are, you know, uh, of Greek history. So you have the, early, the, er, the earlier era of the, the naturalists and the rationalists, right? Democritus and all these guys followed by the Sophists, who were literally not, not very different from the voices that you hear today, you know, just people who love arguments for the sake of arguing, right? Who you, you can talk to them for like an hour and, and, and you don't really reach any conclusions. Uh, things are the way they are because they are. And if they were not, they would be different. You know, like this is how, these are, this is how the Sophists were. And then what happened after the Sophists? Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Okay, if if you actually look, so this is the curve of Greek philosophy. If you look at the curve of Greek politics, it would it the, the two curves would be the same, right? So the curve would be like this, and then you'd go into deterioration, and that deterioration would reflect the period of the Sophists, and then it goes up again, you know, into the, the the establishment of democracy. Of course, Socrates himself was was skilled, you know, through a democratic was was executed through a democratic decision, but democracy was on the rise, and with it, free thought and ideas and things like that. And so, I think that what is happening right now, I don't want to say in, it's inevitable. I, I just say it's predictable. It's comprehensible. It can still change. It can still change with effort. And, and if you ask me in particular, so if you look at the Muslim Ummah, for example, look at the ideas that we produce. The Quran is always there. But look at the ideas that we produce. The ideas that we produce are proportionate to what? Are proportionate to our intellectual, economic, and political prosperity. In times when economic and political prosperity were, were achieved, our ideas reflected that. And then you go into times of deterioration. When you have Sisi and Asad, you know, people like this in the Muslim world, what do you expect the ideas that we will be produced? So I, I'm, I'm praying that inshallah the movement of history will take us into another renaissance. I, I have no doubt about that. But what I'm saying is that that type of renaissance can be uh, accelerated. And it can be accelerated. And I've said this before and people always call me crazy. What we need is a philosophical revolution. What we need is the reintroduction of philosophical ideas and philosophical debates, is the application of reason, is the application of rationality. A lot of young Muslims are losing their faith because, and I'm not saying become rationalists either. That's not what I'm saying. We maintain our spirituality. I'm just saying that we have to be ready to engage rationalists when they want to engage us.